Hello guys, this is Cameron from BusybodyVisa.com and today we're going to talk about the Elliot Eastman case. For all of you in the YouTube sphere, I'm sure you know that unfortunately a young man, an American vlogger named Elliot Eastman, was kidnapped in the province of Mindanao. And now there's a video that's circulating around Facebook, apparently of his body, but that has not been confirmed by any of the mainstream media sources that I checked, so I'm not going to say that that video was him for sure. So before I talk about what the U.S. government does to rescue kidnapped victims in foreign countries, I want to talk to you a little bit about the shifting demographics in the Philippines. So traditionally, the Philippines was a destination for retirees, specifically vets. They would come here on their pension, and it wasn't really enough to live a good life in America. They'd come here, and back in the day, you could live like a king on $1,500 a month. That's not true anymore. But the Philippines was kind of set up for that. The Philippines was set up for retirees because that is what the typical expat here was, a retiree. That's why you have the 13A, which is designed for retirees who marry a Filipina and are helping to support her family. And then the SRRV, which stands for the Special Residence Retirees Visa, which is really good for vets because it allows vets to stay as long as they want within and out privileges, and it's a permanent visa. However, in the last decade or so, especially within the last five years, things have really changed. There is a lot more younger expats that are coming here than before. And the system isn't really set up to accommodate them. There is no digital nomad visa here. Um, there really is no visa at all, except for the tourist visa. And the tourist visa wasn't really meant for that. The tourist visa was supposed to be for people that want to go to Palawan, take some pictures, and then go home. It wasn't meant for people to live on. And so the government, like most governments, are slow, and it hasn't caught up with the changing demands of society. So another big issue is a lot of younger guys are coming here, and younger broke guys. And in places like Vietnam, South Korea, Thailand, that's not as big of a deal, because if you're a young, broke expat, then you can always fall back on teaching English to make a living. You won't get rich off of it, but it will keep a roof over your head. However, the Philippines doesn't have that option because there is no English teaching industry here. They already speak English, so they don't need foreign English teachers. If you're a younger expat and you're not a highly skilled worker, then really your only option for a lot of people is vlogging. And that's why you're seeing all these vloggers coming here and doing the same things. I mean, this place is just flooded with vloggers. And because of that competition, you, you need to do stupider and crazier things to get views. And in the case of Elliot Eastman, he decided to move to Zamboanga, a very dangerous part of the Philippines, in order to... and married a Muslim woman. So I think he was also out of love. But And you see people like him doing dumber and dumber things just to get views because anyone who does youtube knows you know it's a roller coaster you always got to be thinking of new ideas and you got to stay fresh and you got to do wacky outrageous things in order to get those views because that's how get it, you're going to make money and i know he was broke because apparently in some of the videos he was complaining that he was having financial problems because he had to spend 14,000 pesos for starlink 14,000 pesos is about $300. Someone who's going to be destroyed financially for $300, that's kind of not what the Philippines had in mind when they wanted retirees to come here. Because here's the thing. Anytime you have two cultures, two people from different cultures, countries mixing, there's going to be conflict. It's just the way it is. But in the Philippines, it wasn't as big a deal because Filipinos are naturally friendly and the expats brought dollars. So it was, you know, win win. Yeah, you know each other, but at the end of the day, it was mutually beneficial. Well, now that you're getting some of these younger cats coming in here that don't have money and they are annoying people, that's going to create problems. And that's why I personally think 
the kidnapping was a message. The fact that they did not demand a ransom for him, which is the normal MO of Muslim extremist kidnappers, tells me that this was a message. That basically, in my opinion, the locals decided once he started complaining about running out of cash, that he was more annoying than he was worth. And he had been warned, reportedly warned, several times by local officials to leave, and he refused because he didn't want to leave his wife, which is understandable. And unfortunately, it does seem that this young man paid the price for that. And my heart goes out to his family. You know, it's awful, and I'm just really sorry that that happened. But to the crux of the video about what the government does when an American gets kidnapped, some people, may, some cynical people may say nothing. They don't do anything. Well, that's not true. In fact, the FBI does take control. They actually have a hostage recovery fusion cell. Their job is specifically to coordinate with local governments to negotiate a release for the hostage. So here's the thing that a lot of people, for some reason, we Americans don't seem to understand. When you are in another country, the United States has a zero jurisdiction there. The United States does not have the authority to send their own military personnel or police officers or FBI agents or CIA agents into a country to rescue you. They cannot. That would be a violation of international sovereignty laws. And that's not going to happen for one person. They did it when it came to Osama bin Laden, but obviously that was a different case. So... The, the best that the government can really do is work with the local authorities and they coordinate together and negotiate the release. But the biggest thing is most kidnappings are financially motivated. These groups kidnap Westerners in order to get funds for the organization. And that is why the U.S. has a long-standing policy of not paying ransoms. Other governments say they don't but they do just through other channels. In fact, the Patriot Act and other executive orders specifically prohibit even families from paying ransom to extremist groups. And you could be prosecuted for it. Now, why is the government so harsh on this? Well, it just goes down to the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. When you're dealing with public policy, you have to decide what's better for everybody as a whole not just the individual. I know it's easier than said when someone you love who's being kidnapped, but as a whole, it's very bad if you end up paying ransoms and funding these terrorist organizations and because they'll keep doing it. Now, I don't know of any high-profile cases where a family actually was prosecuted for paying a ransom, but just know that a family could be prosecuted and the U.S. government absolutely will not pay a ransom if you get kidnapped. So that makes it very difficult to negotiate your release. They say that it also makes it less likely to kidnap an American because they know they're not going to get any money from the government. And just a joke, there is a uh, Chris Rock, he had a funny joke about why black people <laughs> never get kidnapped because if you, know, you kidnap a black person, you call the family, they go, oh, please, Tyrone, owe me money. Click. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, so they do try to negotiate and they do actually make an effort. That being said, there is a sentiment in the State Department that most of these cases, the kidnapping was the own person's fault, especially like in cases like this, where someone repeatedly ignored warnings not to go there. This area of Mindanao specifically is level four travel advisory, which means do not go there. He, the Zamboanga government itself tells people not to go there. So it's kind of like at this point, it's like, you know, it sucks, unfortunately, but he kind of brought it on himself, as harsh as that sounds. And so that's why you're not, I mean, they're going to try to do what they can, especially now that it's gotten media attention. But don't expect any Britney Griner type of situation where they're going to exchange, do a prisoner exchange or anything like that to get him back if he is still alive, which it does seem like he is not. 
So I did. I was just wanting to cover that and talk about, yes, the U.S. government does care. Yes, the U.S. government does do things to try to rescue you. But, you know, the reality that a lot of Americans, including myself, need to realize is when you travel abroad, you are at the mercy of the country you are at. This American passport does not create a impenetrable force field where you think they can't arrest you and that you're immune to their laws and customs. You're not. And I, I think for some reasons we Americans have this issue because some people are extremely nice to us when they find that we're Americans, but niceties, you know, platitudes do not equal invulnerability. So I hope that you found this video helpful. And if you have any questions about it, please let me know. Thanks. Bye.